everybody, and welcome back to another episode of World Bigfoot Radio. I'd like to encourage everybody, if you like this show, to do your little part and like, share to your friends. Give us a thumbs up, you know, and uh, all that really helps us. If you want to do more than that, and you want to be Knights of the Realm, Heroes of the Realm, donate to keep the show coming to you. Send it to the address on the screen. And uh, today we're going to have a returning guest here who's been on the show a couple times. I'm really excited to have him back again. This is the man who wrote the book on tree structures. Literally. And then he wrote another one. He got two books on tree structures. And uh, he's one of my favorite guests to have on the show. I'm going to be catching up on what he's been up to since the last time he was on. And so with that, please welcome back Soul Man of Squatching, Rich Soul. Duke, good times. Thanks for having me. An auspicious occasion to be. Uh, it's always an auspicious occasion when you're on the show. You always got interesting things to talk about. and Sometimes it's like major breaking news, too. So extra cool, brother. And I know you got a bunch of stuff you want to get to. But before that, I want to catch everybody up on last fall. I was at the uh, International Bigfoot Conference, and uh, Igor Bursev actually did a presentation there, and I was fortunate enough to get a chance to meet the guy and talk to him for a while. And Wow, what a thrill that was. You know, this guy's like one of the top squatchers on the planet, if, the, if not the man himself. And then I found out afterwards that the week after that, uh, he, he was over somehow mysteriously um, in Nebraska squatching with you. Uh, so how'd that come? <laughs> how'd that come about and how'd that all go? Yeah, that was just an amazing experience. That was, you know, when you start down this, uh, road into the, into squatching and getting out and doing research, you just don't know, you know, who you're going to encounter in the, in the future. And I would have never suspected that I would have, uh, gotten to get out into the field with Dr. Birdseth, but that was truly an honor. Uh, we have, uh, uh, we're work, uh, he came here and, and kind of uh, to, to do some research with the, at the Omaha Reservation, where I do a lot of my research up there with Barry. And also, uh, I had made some connection with DNA research with the Zana uh, that he had uh, uncovered Quit Skull back in the early 70s. So it was uh, kind of a mutual respect in what we were both working towards some, uh, some DNA and working towards getting... Um, this this mystery figured out from that level but having him come in Nebraska was just an amazing experience we drove uh he came here to Lincoln where I live and then we we uh we drove up to the Omaha reservation which is a little over two hours from uh where I live on the uh, on the Missouri River and uh we we had some interesting uh experiences while we were there so I don't know if you want me, want me to get into what what, what what occurred at the night, or what all you want me to talk about there? But I could share some of the some of the things we. Experienced. As far as I'm concerned, you can take an hour and walk us through it point by point. But I don't know if the audience would put up to that. Uh, so yeah, tell us about uh, tell us at least about all the uh, the major cool things that happened. You know, I got to parenthetically mention that um, at this point, you are the only Bigfoot researcher I know that has been out in the field with both Dr. Jeff Meldrum and Igor Bert, Dr. Igor Burtsev. So, uh, I think that's extra cool right there, but yeah, tell us this tale of Igor squatching with you. Yeah, I, I feel very, uh, privileged and, and fortunate, especially, you know, living here in Nebraska, you wouldn't expect all of these people had to travel very far and had to want to come here. To, to, to go out. So that was really cool. Um, yeah, uh, one of the first things when I was driving uh, Igor, we were talking about, uh, you know, I kind of asked him, you know, I was like, this is a great opportunity just to pick this this man's mind. And he's, and he, I said, so how did this, you first get into this? And he was like, in 1961, he went on a, his first expedition, which was with Sean Marie uh, Kaufman, who was uh, one of the founding uh Commonology members of the research uh, field from Russia. She was a French scientist, and he told me this was uh, September of last year when I when he was when he came, and he said, you know, next month October will be her 99th birthday. Oh, and good lord! Is yeah, she she's still, still squatching? <laughs> uh, I don't know if she's squatching, but she's still alive and living in France, and. She's no, you just mentioned that Igor's first squatching trip was in '61. No, that's the year I was born. 
And yes. uh, he appears to be in better condition than I am. I, I'm kind of beat up at present. And he seems to be doing really damn good, honestly. So for, you know, a guy yeah, his he, age, man, he's like in scary good shape. Absolutely. He's 70, well, he's 79 then. He's probably going to be 80 this year. So uh, he, you know, in, I believe, the late 50s, he was the Russian rowing champion. He had told me that also. So. He was uh, basically a world-class athlete to be a rowing champion in Russia. So not only, you know, a Ph.D., but somebody who's just in really uh, phenomenal physical shape. That's a great combination for somebody that's going to get out in the field and actually go look for evidence, which is one, another thing I love about Igor, because he does get out in the field and look for evidence. Oh, absolutely. Uh, he, he is um, He's just contagious when you're out there with him because he's just so excited and and uh, so it's a lot of fun. But I was going to tell you uh, what he told me about that first ex- uh, expedition they went on, that they rode in the back of a, basically it was a tractor that hauled them up into like the Caucasus Mountains. And they had a, uh, they were on a flatbed and they were hauled up into this area <laughs> up in the mountains uh, on the back of a flatbed of a tractor. So that's how they got transported. But once they got up in there... <laughs> Once they got in there, uh, one of the first things they started looking at was horse braiding. And they had braids of uh, the horses uh, were getting braiding of uh, the local leshy, which are the, uh, or the almasty, uh, which are the wood dwellers, uh, Russian snowman, they called them. And so, uh, you know, horse braiding, having hairs and horse braiding, uh, many people have associated that with the Sasquatch, Bigfoot here in the U.S. Well, he was looking at that back in the early 60s, so uh, that's, I thought that was very cool, and that is something we'll see in Nebraska, too. I don't know if you see a whole lot of that up there, if you know people with horses, but uh, that is, that, that's kind of a common thing for them to be braiding. I don't know if it's, the, if it's the females who do that or why they would be braiding, uh, but well, Bigfoot Outlaw's got theories about that, and it has to do with horses being molested. And, uh, yeah, we've had – I've had two or three guests on uh, that have had this done to their horses, so, including one of them that owned a horse ranch. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, fairly well convinced that that's actually what's going on. They're, they're messing around with the horses. Bear will tell you the braiding thing is because they grab the horse's mane uh, with one hand to control it. And they wrap their fingers around in the in the uh, mane, and it it you know, after enough wraps, it makes it look like a braid. It stays braided looking. Gotcha. Okay. Well, that apparently has been going on for a long time because that's that was something that they had first started looking into. So, I thought that was interesting. Uh, you know, that was kind of just some of our talks as we were heading up to the Omaha Res, and then when we got there, uh, we um, spent time with with uh, Barry, who um, is, uh, does all of the res watching, and he's a real good buddy of mine. I'm part of res watching, and I go up there all the time with him. So we were able to get uh, Dr. Bertseff out into the bush uh, and do some uh, research. And uh, we looked at, uh, you know, he, one of the things people don't realize about him also is that the tree and stick structures is something that he's been doing for a long time. He's he showed me pictures of a researcher in Russia that was doing it, I think, even back in the 60s or 70s. But uh, he started officially documenting it himself around uh, 99 or 2000, I believe, is what he was telling me. So um, those still aren't getting enough attention in the mainstream uh, science or mainstream. But most of us researchers who are out in the field uh uh, really rely on that sort of thing and to understand how important these structures are and finding their habitat. So, and the yeah. one thing that I thought was cool that he he was into, you know, I thought you know I wanted to show him some real big ones, but we stumbled across these really small, intricate ones that were just little, it's kind of a uh, very interesting little breaks and stuff that were hanging. And they were all kind of hanging, and they all looked the very same, but they were all kind of in a line, and they were hanging that way. So. Uh, it's very interesting. He, he took pictures of that, and um, and then we went into uh, um, to to get back into the field. We kind of talked about a little bit of what the research we were doing there. Um, Did he uh, mention he talked, anything about rock stacks? 
Did they, did they pay any attention to that? Um, he he did uh, he did he has done some research. He sent there is a he had a book actually at that time that he was uh, that he had published that he was just bringing here. And what he wound up he has some some in in that about rock stacking, but we didn't talk about too much about that uh, while he was here. But he did he did have a very interesting amount of research of all that sort of thing. Uh, so, but. What we did during the day, we uh, with Dr. Bertseff, we introduced. We had kind of a meet and greet, and we we uh, he uh, told us some stories. And one of the stories he told us was about in Russia. There was a lady, and it wasn't too far from Moscow. I think it was within fifty miles of Moscow that he had followed up with the report. And this is kind of what he does. You know, he lives in the city in Moscow, and him and Doctor uh, and him and Dmitry Vanoff, and uh, they're in the Darwin uh, Museum. There, they have their office and work out of that for the international hominology. And uh, so he had to, you know, when he gets information or leads, he, he leaves Moscow and goes out into the hinterland there of uh, Russia. Well, he was going to check out this uh, lady had had a, uh, a sighting. And she starts explaining it to him. She was in her garden. And this is what I th thought was very intriguing. Uh, he said as she was gardening and she looks up and sees this large, hairy creature standing there. And she became very concerned. And all of a sudden, it started to disappear kind of in segments. And it, w it disappeared right in front of her down to its leg. And then its leg disappeared. And uh, I was very kind of uh, shocked that he would just be, you know, so open about these sort of stories. And really, matter of fact, that this is, you know, yeah. what well, she was we would consider to be extreme woo woo here in the West and would be mostly yeah. just ignored. Yeah. And so here, you know, one of the preeminent uh, researchers in the world is just has no trouble talking about this sort of thing. So I thought, you know, wow, that was that's just amazing. I had not any inclination that this would be foreshadowing something that we would be having later that evening. And this is something, again, that it just, it's kind of a quantum entanglement. I don't know how to explain it, but when you are in the, this research, it just seems like things kind of build on each other and something that happened in, during the day or something that happened, you know, um, a few days before that might might be uh, foreshadowing something that's going to happen very soon. So, Thank you, uh, so we went out uh, went out to this uh, area that we wanted to um, that that was very active. We've had a lot of tree structures there, and it was pretty deep into the timber. The almost it's what they call this the Los Hills there, which is right off of the Missouri River, and it's it's between uh, like Omaha, Nebraska, and then. Uh, up towards Sioux City or Sioux Falls, South Dakota is up that way, if people are familiar with the, that region. But the Missouri River just basically hugs the the border of Iowa and Nebraska there. So uh, we so we were, were in these low hills, which are really big bluffs, uh, kind of deep uh, uh, bluffs and, and canyons that have um, uh, natural um, the springs, uh, karst systems, caves, those sorts of things, which I've talked about before as, as excellent habitat for them. Uh, so we were in this area and there was a lot of structures and we just got there and, and Barry likes to, he, he speaks the Omaha language, so he, he wanted to introduce Dr. Bertseff to the local uh, Sasquatch there or the Seatonga that they refer them to in the Omaha language. And so he is talking and I decide, well, I'm going to do a wood knock and just see if we can get some activity, you know, to get some confirmation. And so I did three wood knocks. And the reason I did three is because I truly believe they, they keep an eye on you while you're in their woods and they kind of know how many people are there, or at least if you're moving around, they're kind of knocking to, to inform other, uh, Sea Tonga or Hamids in the area that you're moving from one area to the next. So I did three knocks to kind of acknowledge that there's three of us here. So I did, you know, three knocks. And sure enough, we get a return knock.
standing there talking, when all of a sudden, whoa. Yeah. I recorded it. Did you Did you guys hear the wood knock? right there and he was like yes i heard it i heard it his hearing's not as great you know because he's uh, almost 80 years old yeah. so but he did hear the wood the return wood knock and so we told them at that time that we're you know uh, this is dr bird stuff he came all the way from russia a very long uh, uh away from here and um you know we respect him very much he's an honored guest of ours we want we want you to come and meet him and we're going to be back tonight and we expect you to come and greet us because we're here to see you. He's come here to see you. So, you know, we, we really made an effort to communicate with them that, you know, we're going to give you time to, to prepare for this, but we're going to be back here tonight and we're bringing Dr. Birdseth with us and we would like to, to for you to come and greet us. So we were kind of setting this up for, for something in the evening to happen than when we came back for that night. So, um, Fast forward then, just to kind of tie all this story together, um, we did go back there then probably about two in the morning. And um, on our way there, uh, uh, Barry was singing a song, and I can't remember the name of the song, but it has to do with uh, the Sea Tonga. It's in the Omaha language, and that we were happy to see you. We want to see you. Something just kind of repetitive. That, uh, you know, and Dr. Birdseth was singing along with him. I have this recorded, but I haven't been able to edit in a while because my computer has been broke. So I have like, you know, like a six hour recording of all this sort of stuff, but I need to break it down. But it's just awesome. You hear Dr. Birdseth singing this song with Barry and, you know, it's a very happy kind of uh, experience as we're, we're driving along in my Jeep in the dark and, and as soon as, you know, we get closer to the area that we're um, going to be um, getting out again where we had that uh, um, wood knock return um, in the, during the day. And I had my, win we had my windows down, we were in my Jeep, and I usually have my recorder running all the time because usually stuff happens just before you get out of your vehicle. Well, Barry started seeing... Um, you know, we call this eye glow. Other people call it eye shine, but uh, I truly believe it's actually some bioluminescence. But uh, anyway, he started seeing some of that, so we stopped, and and uh, and there was some kind of closer to the road, and we were trying to show that, but then they kind of faded back. So then we 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 went on a little longer, and when we got to that location, we all got out. Uh, there was actually four other people with us that had came with us that night. And um, so we all, there was two vehicles there. So we all kind of gathered around together. And when we go into, um, typically in the, these woods, we, we usually don't use any of our um, equipment. We turn all of our lights off and everything. At this particular time though, Barry had had a um, like $4,000 monocular that was a, uh, a uh, the police the local police had had and they let us use it on the uh, to 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 do a little scanning around while um, Dr. Birdsat was here so we showed it to him and he was pretty into it he was it was a very small one but it was very high powered you could see about everything and I kind of regret doing that because when we got back, got out there things started happening right away and he was kind of scanning around with this this little monocular but um the first thing that i noticed as we all get to this location we all come um we, we come into this area that we were at was a 
it's like a uh, blue type of light that kind of just filtrated through the timber. And it was probably about 100 yards from us. And I had never seen anything like this before. Now, I've heard many people talk about it, including the first expedition I was ever on. They talked about orbs and stuff. And I was like, wow, I, don't, I really have a hard time believing this. But until you experience this yourself, you you know, you I, I can see people doubting it. So I totally uh, um, can relate to that. But what people need to understand is that the duality of, of, the, of this hominid of Sasquatch that we're studying, that there is a there is a physical and a non-physical side to it. And we have to, uh, if you're going to truly study this, you have to look at the whole thing. And that's something that I really, I felt Dr. Birdseff is, is, is such a pioneer and so open to that. Uh, just have so much respect for him for being that way. It really imprinted that onto me that, you know, I just got to be open-minded and move with and go with it. So I, I'm watching this blue light kind of filter through. It's almost kind of like a little fog coming through, but it's a blue, blue color and it's filtering about a hundred yards away. It filters past us. And I'm like, Barry, do you see that? And he's like, yep, yep, I saw it. And he told me later uh, that he believed that is when things start to cloak. And he said that uh, actually there may have been many of them there at the, with that amount of blue light filtering through there, there was probably quite a few of them that were there. So um, a little while later, we we are standing there and we introduce Barry uh, introduces Dr. Birdseff and he's there with him. And, and we um, basically, Barry asked them to come forward. He's, he's speaking in the Omaha language that we're here and we want to, uh, we want to sign from you, but we also want you to come forward. We want to see you, we want to meet you. And I'm, I, you know, at that time it is, it is very dark there. It's absolutely dark. We don't have any lights on. We had all of our equipment turned off by then. And uh, Barry starts saying, do you guys see this? There's, there's something here. There's a couple of them right here. And I'm standing next to Barry and he starts telling me, uh, that one of them's trying to reach out to him and he's kind of sucking like he's sucking his stomach and like he's kind of, you know, like concerned. And so I put my hand on his shoulder. I said, it's, you know, I'm here, I'm here. It's all right. I was like, you know, I, I can't see anything. And he put his, he put his hand up in the air and as high as he could reach. And he said, you got to look up. And so all of a sudden I look up and that's when this outline, and the only thing I could say, Duke, uh, that I had any um, any reference to was the Predator movie. I know it sounds corny, but in that Predator movie, when they are translucent, uh, imagine something being completely dark, but with a translucent form there in front of you. And it was about uh, probably nine feet tall, the actual... Um, what what I was seeing was just kind of a outline of what would be probably his head and shoulders. And so it wasn't like you could just see this round head. You, it must have been the hair and stuff because it was just this big, huge figure in front of me. And when you're looking up, now I'm only within probably three feet of this in front of me. And so I literally have to look straight up to see it. When you're in that situation and you see this, your mind, at least in my mind, is is questioning, you know, is this my glasses? Is there something on my glasses? What the, what is this? And we, uh, we're, we're standing there. Another member that's with us starts uh, getting very concerned. LV, uh, he thinks something with his legs, his legs are going numb. So like we all kind of talk to him. We believe there is at least two of them there. And then back behind us was uh, Dr. Birdseff had been out front, but for some reason he walked back behind us to, to rest. Uh, it had been a long day to rest on the bumper. And between him and us at that time, someone said a large dark figure walked between, between us there. So we were there for maybe 20, 30 minutes, maybe up to 40 minutes. It could have been, it's hard to tell. But that whole time we had this interaction and um, uh, at, and it was just surreal to me. Again, I was really struggling to see if this was actually 
you know, what I'd experience if this, if there wasn't something on the lens of my glasses. But I can tell you there was nothing on my lens. I, I later looked and, and, and what I had seen was uh, this uh, cloaking uh, sea tonga. And it just, it was just surreal knowing that earlier in the day, Dr. Burtz, I've talked about that. So uh, we wound up going to another area after that, and uh, it just was mind blowing to me. So uh, I have, I'm fully engaged and did research on that and how it could be possible for something to cloak. And, you know, I have to say from my own experience, they, this is something they do. I know other researchers have had that experience, and, and now I can say just within like two or three feet of me, I, I had had a very large, maybe nine foot tall one. So, so that was quite a, that was quite an experience and something I'll never forget. And the fact that it happened with Dr. Birdseff being there was just amazing. Um, and just to you know, back you up on that, I mean, not only do I hear reports of that sort of thing happening, but we're starting to actually get visual evidence for it too. Uh, as I was telling you before we started recording, I got a picture uh, where there's a pretty obvious distortion in it. And if you look closely at the distortion, draw an outline around it, and you can even see where the eyes and the mouth are on it. It, there, it Everything else around it's in focus. And there's just one area, and it's not far from the camera. Everything in front of it and behind it's in focus, but that area is a blur. Uh, and yeah, I mean, to me, that's that looks like a really good example of a cloaking Bigfoot. And I got another one I'd like to use, but I'd need to get permission from the person that actually filmed it. I had somebody who's a listener to my show here yesterday who was in town visiting, took him out squatching and whatnot, and he showed me a screen capture he got from somebody else's video where you've got uh, the camera in the same position for several frames of the film, and a Bigfoot just fades in. I mean, there's like nothing there at the beginning of the first frame, and by the end, last frame, there's a Bigfoot standing there, and the camera didn't move, and it didn't move into position. It just faded in. Um, so really weird stuff going on there. Well, and if I could speak a little bit to the what I think the scientific side uh, of that uh, is, just to try to explain, um, to put, you know, it gets thrown in the woo category, but I really think uh, there are some... Uh, scientific merit to that. Uh, one of the things that we know that uh, Sasquatch will use is um, uh, they they will either break or crush rocks, and you know that's common for them to breaking and crushing rocks. But if you start looking at minerals or what uh, monatomic elements or quartz, and one thing that a monatomic elements uh, would have like gold or silver, is if you have uh, um, there's, they're 99.9% .9 pure, but there's like that 0.0% that is not, uh, not gold. That's the monatomic element that's in it. Well, these monatomic elements have very uh, peculiar um, traits to them. They, they you can basically, um, they, they have the ability to uh, basically be like interdimensional type uh, features to them. They have, uh, if they're pulverized or crushed, which I think that's probably if they're in jest, maybe they play a part of that within the, the, uh, uh, the these hominids ingesting them. If they pulverize or eat quartz, this may create some biological effect uh, within, within them by using these elements, these monatomic elements. The other thing that can be used to affect this at an inter interdimensional level is uh, the the ley lines. And one of the things that I've noticed, I've started looking at these magnetic ley lines. And if you look at uh, the ley line from where I live in Lincoln to where the Omaha res, there's a ley line that goes right through there. I'd be curious to, to take a peek. I do have a map of the magnetic ley lines. I bet you have some going through somewhere near your area also. Yeah, if but, there's a map of that, send it on over. We've been trying to figure out where there is one so that we can take a look at it. Yeah, I'll say, I have a map. I'll send it to you and you can post there, it. It's a national... We got megaliths around here. I'd like to see how many of those are sitting on ley lines. Yeah. So, so here's what here's what I think is going on. And uh, actually, this uh, this Russian researcher from the 50s or 60s, Damden was his name. He had a picture of a uh, leshy or a Russian uh, snowman, and he had his uh, his knees underneath of him, his head to the ground and his feet uh, were on the ground and he was 
they said that that's how they were sleeping. Well, it from what I've gathered, this is possibly a way for them to, uh, if they were on one of these magnetic ley lines and they were ingesting these sorts of monatomic elements, this could be a way for them to get sort of some sort of bioelectric or bio uh, um, uh, energy this way that could change their frequency. Now it's 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 a bit of a stretch, but when you look at uh, the 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 boson uh, Higgs uh, particle. And um, there is the Higgs field that where all matter exists in. And so uh, if you can uh, change your frequency and come in, uh, in interdimensionally in and out of something by using these monatomic elements, which we know they have the ability to, 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 um, to create these things, and then using electromagnetic energy to generate that within your body, um, all the science is there to say this is possible. Are they doing it and how they're doing it? We completely don't know, but I do think they're the, the science, the basic science to us is there. And I think it would have to do with these electromagnetic uh, uh, ley lines with monatomic elements that they could crush uh, and eat. You know, if you have quartz, that many times there is gold in their quartz and even quartz would, would probably uh, suffice in that. Uh, to opening portals and those sorts of things. So um, start talking about the interdimensional thing, cloaking, all of these woo kind of things that yeah. that are attached to it. Uh, Let me back you up on this for a second before you go on. Yeah. The quartz thing, just about every hotspot that I find out here where there's consistent Bigfoot activity, there's quartz. It's either lying on the ground, there's huge quartz deposits, it's all over the place. Uh, Perfect. And where the, there's quartz, there tends to be gold also. Exactly. So. And that's why probably a lot of abandoned gold mines that have rumors that, you know, haunted by Bigfoot and Bigfoot's protecting the old miners' gold. They aren't interested in the gold all that much. They want the quartz. Um, <laughs> quartz tuners, uh, you know, in an old fashioned radio, the dial is quartz. That's mm -hmm. how you're changing the frequency. So this is exactly the same thing that we're talking about. Um, another thing. Uh, both bear and cat have seen Bigfoot lying down in that position with their uh, their foreheads on the ground. Yeah. And um, cat, for her part, claims that what they're doing is they're recharging. They get on a, a ley line and they put their forehead on it for about 15 minutes, and it recharges uh, get the energy in them. And then apparently, if they've ingested the quartz or whatever, they can use that energy plus the quartz to pull off their little maneuver and, and cloak or fade away for a period of time they can't do it forever but yeah for, it's like a bio little, yeah, yeah for a little bio while electric biology thing yeah, Absolutely. And then when they run out of energy they go back to again like the ley line or whatever and Ingest put some that down on it soak up some more energy and then they're charged to do a little trick again if they need to yeah yeah i think that's exactly what's happening and i i'll send you a picture i might have already done it but you can post it when what we're talking about and it was this damden it was his name it was a researcher and he had had a drawing this it was a drawing of, of them doing this exact thing laying down like that, that way so they're doing that in russia they were doing that to whatever 50 60 years ago and so I, I have no doubt they're still doing it and that's what that's kind of this you know the secret to this that there and there is some biological there's some scientific um, um, evidence that this is possible so uh, I don't think you know you can totally throw this and say you know it's woo and that I think you have to accept that this is a part of the duality of their existence that they have these uh, non-physical things that they can do that um, that most scientists don't want to address, but right. you know we're here, and I'm. I think you've got to talk about it. You've got to because anybody that's going to be doing this research is going to experience it someday. Now I know there will be people listening to us today that don't, that does not believe this, but I will tell you someday in the future, if you keep doing this, you're going to say, "Oh, old Duke and Rich were right. Uh, I'll be damned if I didn't see something that was strange out there." Yeah. And uh, it's it's something that's inevitable. So the other thing I wonder about Rich with their little cloaking trick, how much the uh, weird construction of their hair has something to do with it? Because you know, um, hollow, uh, transparent, it picks up the color of whatever it's next to. Um, you wouldn't think 
You know, I mean, they wouldn't like need a full on cloak with an ability like that already. It wouldn't seem like it would take that much more to make them completely fade away. Absolutely. And there's a there's a color that I think the government came up with called Fanta Black. And they're used, that color is used because it does just, you can literally, if you were to paint yourself all black and stand where it's being painted, you'd disappear. So certainly colors and our ability to see that um, doesn't make it very difficult for them to cloak around us. Uh, if they can do kind of a chameleon kind of like thing and assimilate other colors that are near them. Um, I well, don't that's know what I'm saying. I mean, you know, if they're going to stand out in the open and fade away, that's cloaking. But yeah. just for natural purposes and stuff, if they're sitting underneath a tree and they're basically, most of them are black for it anyway, they look like a shadow. You're not going to see them. And yeah. to break up their outline, maybe they got their arm on the tree. So part of their arm is blending with the tree because the hair color is picking up the tree's trunk color. Part of them is sitting up in the canopy of the tree where the branches are. So it's looking a green color like that. So you're not even seeing their outline like you would see a human's outline. You're seeing pieces of it. And the pieces you were seeing just look like a black shadow. Absolutely. So, yeah, their ability to to simulate and just kind of—I mean, we know that in nature, you can walk right by a, a fawn in the in the in the in the bush. So, yeah, uh, they're not blending or anything. It's just their camel <laughs> pattern so good, and they're not moving. Yeah. You don't even notice them. Absolutely. So we're just—you know—we are not the most inept people <sighs> of, of seeing things and and using our senses. We just don't have it. So it's not very hard to trick us in the wild and I, I suspect they know that another thing is it's interesting uh, typically they'll stay uh, they try to stay a good 70 yards away from you if you're out in the woods and you have some trailing you or whatever uh, a lot of times they'll stay about 70 yards away well if you if they're doing that most cameras I don't care what camera you're using unless you've got a really good zoom any kind of pictures you're going to be taking is just going to be blob squatch. You know, it's just not going to be clear enough from that far away. Yeah. And um, they have uh, the Patterson Gimlin film was an eight millimeter. So that was really good. But most of the stuff that we have today, even though we think we've got great cameras and stuff, um, you know, just take a picture of something from a hundred yards away. And it's still not that the pixelization is not that great unless you're using a really good camera. And let so, me refer everybody to a show that I've connected to my playlist from Modern Explorer, Mateo Arguello over there in Colorado, who actually did a short subject on why the hell is it so hard to get a picture of Bigfoot? And he used his girlfriend as the example of Bigfoot and just let her run around and tried to get the camera to like autofocus on her and stuff. And it was the usual, you know, pathetic, you can't get a decent picture of yeah, anything blob squash, sort of that's situation. All exactly. Get. And this was a yeah. human, it's during the day. Yeah, he knows she's trying, there. Yeah, yeah still she's right. wanting you to take a picture, and you're trying to, and you still can't get it right. Yeah, I mean, people need to understand that that just just the the nature of them being far enough away, and the, our cameras still are not capable of taking great photos that way. It's just just not set up that way. So, uh, you know, it's it's. I know people get like, well, I'll, why can't anybody get a good picture? Well, if you're going to be criticizing people that way, you need to go out and try it yourself because it's not easy at all. Yeah, it's get not. out there and then show us your good pictures and then you can <laughs> tell us all how we suck, but until then, shut up. Act, act, definitely. So uh, anyway, that's just kind of a little side note with that, but it is... You know, I just want people to fully understand what we're dealing with of the duality of, of the nature of, of this is that there are two sides to it. There's a physical side that, you know, we do have the footprints, the structures. Uh, we, you know, we're working on DNA and hair and all of the actual sightings that people have physically seen them. We have that in the physical world, but we also have this non-physical part of it that is very much all a part of the same being. And and as we move forward, uh, people, I think that's where most people struggle with this is that they just want it to be, you know, the deer in the woods or a panda bear or a fox or, or something. They, they want it to be something that is just in the physical presence. And it's simply something different than that. So uh, it's not easy to um, to get this into a square peg uh, we have to think outside the box um, you know but the thing uh, <laughs> the thing that gets me about that is uh, 
if you're going to be actually scientific, you've got to be completely open-minded and not discard out-of-place artifacts, which in this case would mean the woo part of it. Dogmatic scientists are not scientists. They're closed-minded because they won't look at all the evidence. Real scientists will look at the weird stuff that doesn't make sense, too, and try and figure out what's going on with it and not just discard it as an out-of-place artifact, which is why I count, you know, people like uh, Dr. Igor Burtsev as a real scientist because he's not automatically going, oh, this is just woo-woo BS and not paying any attention to it. He's actually looking into it. And when you look into it, you start finding out that there's there there. Absolutely. And, you know, the thing was when we had uh, Dr. Burtsev, when I was having, we were all having that experience. It was Barry and I, and there was a couple other people that were able to see this that was in front of us. And it wasn't until I was able to, Barry told me to look up that I could see it. But I asked Igor if he had saw it. And uh, he was kind of tired. I think he had sat down on the, um, the, the, uh, fender of the vehicle and he was excited he said I, they love to be here i mean he was just ecstatic his energy he said the energy is so good it's great energy here but he didn't see what we saw uh, unfortunately he was not up there with us when this happened and you know you're thinking well why wouldn't you get you know a premier researcher up there and get him a look but you have to think when you're standing there in the dark and you got stuff going around and you really don't know what's happening and you know you try to remain calm um most people in these situations would have been very afraid we had some people with us that had um that that thought that their legs was getting grabbed and was getting numb and so that we were trying to calm them down so there was a lot going on during that experience uh, i wish uh, Igor could have saw it, but he did not see it. But, uh, you know, I have it all recorded on audio, us kind of walking through the whole thing. So it's pretty cool. But um, I wish he would have, you know, been able to see it. But I'll tell you, until uh, Barry told me to look up, I wouldn't, I could have stood there and not, and said I didn't see anything either. So it was, uh, it was really an eye opening experience that way to um, have them that close and, and have no idea that they were there until I looked up. So uh, just kind of wanted to get that. that. That's a great story. And I just had an awesome time with Dr. Burtsev and was a, I keep in, in touch with them on other things that we're working on, uh, still doing some work on uh, with DNA and that sort of thing. So uh, just a great connection. And, and hopefully uh, he'll get to come back to the U.S. again and spend some time with some of us researchers again, because that it's just an amazing experience to have him around. Oh, yeah, I definitely want to meet him again. I, I, you know, angling to get him on the show at some point here. So that's another thing, too. Yeah, he's uh, and, and, you know, his English is good. Um, it's uh, um, I know he's just very busy all the time. He's always got something going on. So I would love to have him uh, have you interview him, though. I, I could try to reach out to him and see. But he is, you know. He is always pretty busy. Busy, busy. Uh, well, for those of us out here that are just like, you know, fanatically interested in Bigfoot and actually would like to know what the luminary Dr. Igor Burtsev has been up to, what's a good place uh, on the Internet to follow what he's doing? Uh, he's He's got, uh, you know, you can always look at, he's on Facebook, you can connect with him that way, but he's got uh, some of the research he's doing on with Sasquatch Canada, He's got uh, some of the hominology papers there on relic hominid inquiry. There's some really good writings that he has on there on the RHI with Dr. Meldrum. And then on even my website, the Knox Giga study, um, I try to keep up with the latest things that, that I've been working on with him. So, um, you know, those are all good places to look and to check out. Um, certainly, hopefully you'll have be able to put a link to my website and some of the stuff that I've been doing. People could follow up on that. Um, yeah, recommended website, Knox Gigas, the Night Giants. Uh, this would be the richest depository of his research. And wow, it's great. Go there, check it out. Excellent website. 
Yeah, I, I've tried to, you know, ultimately what I've done, and I'm just trying to put together uh, all the, the my field research and just put it out there for everybody. Uh, you can, all my research, anything that you have an interest in that I've been doing is on my website. It's free. Uh, you can go look and read and, and, and read my field notes, read the, I have audio uh, attached to it from like SoundCloud and all that. So, um, it's just, there's a lot of really good things in there and a lot more than I could share on any show, but it's, uh, it's ongoing. It's a living archive that I have. And so it's, it's, I'm real happy with what I put together there. And like I said, it doesn't, nobody has to pay a dime. They can just go there and, and read and spend as much time as they want read, looking at my research. Um, and this goes like, for shows that Rich has been on of mine previously. He's been on several shows here. And anything we've discussed on this show, believe me, he's got a lot of extra detail on it on his website. Go check it out. Yes, yeah, and we've done. You know, we did the uh, we did the subterranean Sasquatch, which was a really good show, and you know the the tree structures, uh, the the DNA, and then stories of things that I've experienced. My uh, kind of my field research so bigfoot of the black death there's another one uh, yeah 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 that was the yep yeah, that's the dna stuff so a lot of great things we've been able to really share with a lot of people i appreciate uh, you giving me this opportunity duke to share this with others i you know i've been very fortunate that i've had made connections with some of the world's greatest researchers in this and i've kind of been fortunate that i've haven't you know, I've had those experiences with these people and, and, uh, you know, overall I kind of keep a low profile most of the time. So being able to come and share this on your show is pretty cool. Uh, I feel that way too, man. I'm glad that I'm the one that's able to coax you out of the woods long enough to go and do a recording and go on a show occasionally yeah. <laughs> because everybody else would be missing out. Otherwise there's a few other people out there that are like you that, uh, I look forward to this in the future, folks. I'm working on getting them on the show, too. They don't want to be on a show. There's a, a husband and wife team in Florida that have been researching the same area, but they've never been on a show. Oh, wow. my God, do they have a lot of evidence. They've got 17 game cams on one area. Oh, God. Wow. Yeah, I mean, the research side, just going out and doing them, that's what got me hooked in, hooked on it, so... I just love to be out in the woods and it's something that stemmed from my early childhood of being out. And, and so it's really an extension of that. And, uh, that's just kind of grown into it. And yeah, to me, it's fun to talk about it, but I, I'm one of those people I'd prefer to be doing it. I'd like to be out in my tent and, you know, nothing more exciting than be in your tent. You know, I didn't share, there was another story I guess I could share when we were camping out that night, but we had some pushing on our tent. Uh, we had one uh, um, that had grabbed my leg and grabbed Barry's leg while we were in the tent. Dr. Bursef was there and uh, they pushed in the top of our tent and uh, just had a, we had a, a branch, a little twig that was thrown at our tent from the road and you can hear it thud and hit and then fall to the ground. So a lot of cool stuff that happened. And um, those are the things that, you know, keep me coming back. It's like, it's an adrenaline rush. I don't know what, what you call it, but I guess I never considered myself an adrenaline junkie, but apparently that's what I am because yeah. most people, I guess, would run away from these things. From these well, I know you considered it to be a scientific experiment, but when really when you, you crawl through the brush and you stick your head around a tree trunk and yell peekaboo and they hurl a log at you, that's <laughs> really kind of not all that scientific, Rich. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We've done stuff like that, believe it or not. So, uh, yeah, we have, we've I know you enough. talked about that on one of the previous shows. That's why I brought it up. I'm like, oh, this kind of veers away from science a bit, more toward yeah. the Jack Link's beef jerky messing with Sasquatch side of things. It's a little close to reality at that point, yeah, or the, you know, TV reality of it. But... It is, you know, <laughs> we we left nothing behind. We've tried everything, and the reality is, it just going out, being yourself, having fun, being open-minded, open-hearted to this sort of thing is real helpful. Uh, that you're going to see more activity that way than you are, 
trying real hard and and coming up with some gimmicks or something like that you know it's just that's not really um if you if, if you're willing to go out and and be in a group of people which i i say you should always be uh, don't go out by yourself i don't recommend that at all but uh, you should be with a group of people like-minded people and just be open to these experiences i you know one of the things I wanted to get into also, I can get into a little bit of the DNA side, but I wanted to talk, I was going to kind of read a little bit of the, some of the old Russian folklore and stuff that was really cool of, of how they, um, some of the ancient um, uh, relationships and how religion uh, had dealt with these in the past. And, you know, if we're, um, if we truly have something that's interdimensional, I think so far people uh, um, are, are trying to be open-minded to that sort of thing, but I think you also got to question what their ultimate intentions are too, or what's going on. And I think, you know, you and I talked about this before the show, but there, there may be several types of these uh, type of hominids and, and one of the ancient ones, I guess people discuss that and then uh, the actual Sasquatch or Bigfoot. And um, the ones that are doing some of this interdimensional stuff, um, you know, I'm a uh, uh, Christian and I, although I'm very open with the science, I'm probably more open than most people. Uh, I am a Christian, so I, I do believe in my faith in Jesus Christ, and I believe that does um, um, help protect me in these situations. I'm not naive in the aspect of thinking that, you know, I can just go out and do whatever I want, but I do believe that my faith has me grounded, and it keeps me, um, it, it gives me uh, a perspective of things that, that when it comes to being afraid of them, I, I'm not afraid. Uh, I have used prayer in the past when I've been in situations uh, that I believe got me through it. And I have, you know, asked for assistance by Jesus Christ and I, my faith in that. So I just, I feel very strongly because a lot of these scientists that I work with are not, um, there's, they, they believe this old uh, type of thinking or uh, having Christianity or old folklore uh, was is um, is kind of archaic, I guess, because they just refer to it to the old times. But you I'm know, living here. Second, you know, along okay. the same lines, we have one guest uh, that's been on my show a few times. It's uh, uh, on the hyper-religious side, and that would be Dave the Deliverer. Uh, a demon destroyer, his exorcist, uh, tossed him into the abyss guy, like over 3,000 exorcisms under his belt. He was in those um, inner tube uh, hip waiter combination thingy floating around a pond fishing and had a, uh, several of them on the far side of the pond are pretty unhappy about him apparently taking their fish and like shaking mesquite trees. And you know how not easy that is. And he didn't realize what it was or anything, so he immediately went into reflex action and started doing an exorcism. And they didn't come any closer. It didn't chase him away. It quieted him down a little bit. They uh -huh. held their ground. He ended up being the one that left. It didn't chase him away, but it, it held him off at least. They didn't approach any closer. So there's at least that that you can say for it. Yeah, yeah, and I, I totally believe that. I, I believe that there that this is uh, this is something that you have to, if you're a Christian, you might want to consider this sort of thing. And um, that if you are having trouble with them, if, uh, say you're in a situation living somewhere and you're, you're, you don't, you're not a person of faith, you may want to, you may want to get the Bible open and look in and do some uh, uh, reading or learn the Lord's Prayer because uh, I do believe that this that will protect you from this sort of thing. Uh, and I've used it in my own. I I haven't I've never told this the story of what happened to me when I first started, but I did have some visiting my own home, and um, when I realized that they were beating on my power boxes and they were in my backyard and under my my bedroom uh, window, they, I could hear them at night and jumping off my roof and uh, I was very concerned. So I did pray to protect myself and my family. I, I was naive, this has been a number of years ago, but they have not been back in the, on my property, but I don't go where they live uh, locally 
um, in their research area. I no longer go to their home, so you know they don't come to my home. But uh, I do believe I did, um, you know, get some protection. At least at that time, I felt that, and I do believe very strongly that it does protect me in the future and things that I do. But I thought I would read. Just for some perspective, we know that um, uh, there's a lot of history, but in, in Russian, uh, one of the, I had asked Dr. Burtz if this was something I had talked to him about, because I, I had done a show on the, um, the contagion. We had done it with you on the contagion theory yeah. and how I thought that they could be, uh, those, those epochs of contagions could have shaped uh, not only what happened in Europe when we had the plague, but also here in the uh, United States when the Native Americans uh, experienced the smallpox that that could have affected the local Sas Sasquatch and wood woos of the in Europe. And when I mentioned that to him, he said right away, just emphatically, that it was actually the introduction of the Orthodox Church, that the Christianity into Russia is what created a division between the people and the, the Leshy there. And so I thought that was interesting because I, I guess I hadn't, at that time, I hadn't considered that. And I still was pretty, felt pretty strongly about my own theories with disease contagions. But so what was the, I, uh, what was the basis behind that? The church thought they were like uh, evil. Forces. They were demons. Uh, they believe they were demons. And I'll, I'll read I will read an incantation of an Orthodox Church of the time. Let me see. Um, it, um, let me read it here. I have it. Let me find the actual. Um, there was quite a bit of research in the um, and even in Scandinavia and stuff in other countries about interaction trolls and that sort of thing right. and what to do. But um, uh, as for uh, Russia in the past centuries, um, there was people when they were interacting with the, the church regarded any relationship as a great sin. Uh, this attitude was reflected in a Belarusian folklore by an incantation, an enchantment, uh, which is a kind of instruction to a young peasant telling him what to do if he is accosted by a, a Rusalka, a Ruskalka, which is a female homage. And it is pointed out that the man should not look at her, but at the ground, and say the following, Water dweller, wood denson, wild, unruly, and whimsical girl, go away, get away, don't show up at my homestead. I kiss the golden cross and abide by the Christian faith, so can't mix with you. Go to the pine forest, to the forest lord. He has prepared a bed of moss and grass and is waiting for you to mix, or is waiting for you there. So um, you are to sleep with him, not with a Christian like me. Amen. So that was like 1893 that that was actually printed, but it was much longer ago that they were using this sort of thing, but they probably still was a part of that sort of, this was a Belarusian uh, folklore incantation. So this would have been something the church would have been ordering people to do. You should not be interacting with them. And uh, it's interesting that the incantation is against being molested by a female Bigfoot. Yeah, yeah, this is something a male would, would a young boy would say to a female. Yeah, that that's, and then that's here a, in North America. It seems to be just the opposite. I mean, that does come up, but usually it's the uh, the male Bigfoot picking up women and running off with them here. Yes, and I think you know. When the uh, that's definitely something that that um, we've seen within the Native American culture, and quite possibly even to modern times, there could be people disappeared in those situations that that have been ran off with, and uh, we certainly don't know um, you know all these missing people, but there, there certainly some could still in those situations be that way. Uh, um, the DNA side of it, if you want me to get into some of that, or uh, yeah, you got any more Russian folklore? Is there anything else <laughs> to share there? Because I'm, I I'm fascinated by that. I mean, you know, like we have we talk about like 